We making moves. We making major moves. We making moves. We making major moves. We going all in. Like we got nothing to lose. We making moves. We making major moves. We making moves. What is up, everybody? I am Mr. Man, and I want to thank you all for coming to back to my page. And if it's your first time on your page, thank you for joining me on this journey. First, first time on this page, on my page, thank you for joining me on this journey. Today we're going to discuss money and the changes that have taken place with money. What type of money? Paper money. Fiat money. And to get these answers, we're going to go back in history here. To understand where you're going, you have to know your past. So we are going to the past here. This is early 2013, I want to say, with Rosie Reels. And I'm going to break this down for you because nobody else has this info like I do. I got you guys down. Let's do this. Rosie Reels. <laughs> Uh, so as we are closing out the final month of this fiscal year, we look forward to what will come in 2013, 2014 for both bureaus. Uh, so for example, this past April, uh, the Federal Reserve publicly announced the release date of the next-gen $100 note. Does anyone know where that, when that release date is? Anyone guess? Woo! Good. So uh, has anyone seen one of the next-gen $100 notes yet? You have. You have them over there. You have the sheets out already. Excellent, excellent. Well, I have one here with me, up front and personal. So this is this is a real next-gen $100 note. I just want to point out a few things if you haven't had a chance to see it up close. But what's exciting about this, you'll notice a couple things. First of all, it is blue. This is a real note, and you'll notice that it is blue compared to what our notes used to, uh, still look like today. Um, you'll notice also this blue security ribbon going down the middle. That is a 3D almost half a million uh, micro lenses, much more sophisticated than a hologram. And so it's an anti-counterfeiting feature. I forgot to mention the other part of my job. I'm also the chair of the Advanced Counterfeit Deterrent Steering Committee. And so this particular steering committee uh, puts forth recommendations to the secretary on all issues of currency design and security features. So this particular 3D blue ribbon, uh, when you move it, is actually- Do you see this here? Do you see this quill? right here okay let's jump into this oh shoot i'm so excited boom what symbolized a pegging to the gold on the u.s hundred dollar note so the symbol that historically represented a pegging to gold on the u.s 100 dollar note is the image of the quill pen the inkwell and the liberty bell all right do we have the quill pen the ink well all we need now is that liberty bell wherever that liberty bell is we got two of the three of them now don't we we got two of the three of them the ink quill pen the ink and then we're just missing that liberty bell to show up here to signify something more these symbols are part of the bill's design and are not a direct representation of a peg to gold okay so the hundred dollar bill features stylized images of the declaration of independence um, a quill pen the sing inkwell and the liberty bell which are all associated with the american history and independence therefore the presence of these symbols on the hundred dollar bill is a nod to the historical and patriotic significance of the United States rather than a direct reference to a peg of gold. Okay, so let's continue this now. I'm on their website. So here we are on the website now, the U.S. Currency Education Program. Where's my... As we scroll down, you'll see what the $100 bill looks like. You'll see the quill. The inkwell. All we're missing is the Liberty Bell at this point. But if you look really closely right here, I think it's right here, you'll see it says 1776. I'll even I'll pull the video up if you don't believe me. Look at this. Watch this. It's horrible, it doesn't show the full thing. So 
So it's just showing us what the security features are and whatnots. All right. So just enjoy the video, the color shifting ink, the security features. All right, security thread. Yep, raised printing so you can feel it. Oh, I missed it. I will show it to you guys, don't worry. Don't worry. Okay, so here we are. Here it is right here. July 4th, 1776. I hope you all can make this out right here. My mouse is not here. It's right here. Right here. Okay, just over there on the left. And this is July 4th, 1776. What's the significance of that? The significance of 1776 on the $100 bill is related to the history of the United States. <coughs> The 1776 is prominently featured on the back of the U.S. $100 bill, it's on the front, as a reference to the signing of the Declaration of Independence July 4th, 1776. This date marks the formal adoption of the Declaration of Independence, which declared the 13 American colonies as independent states and no longer part of the British Empire. No longer part of the British Empire. Therefore, the presence of 1776 on the $100 bill is a tribute to this pivotal moment in American history. All right, let's jump back to Rosie. Actually, kind of motion activated. You will see bells and hundreds that move in the opposite direction when I move the note. If you haven't seen it in action, uh, I think I might even have it with me when I sign. We'll see. We'll see if I get the security to do that. Um, but if you get a chance to see it up close, it really is exciting because you know, one of the biggest threats to counterfeiting is a lot of people really don't know how to tell if something is real or not. And so by just by moving the note back and forth, this is obviously very, very hard to duplicate when it's a 3D uh, uh, motion activated uh, feature like this. The other piece that you'll notice is uh, some um, color shifting ink, both in the hundred and the bell and the inkwell. So again, when you move it, it changes from green to copper and then actually the bell and the inkwell appears and disappears within the right light. So again, it's very easy to detect whether or not it's, it's real. And then, of course, one of my favorites, uh, the signatures. So you'll notice what's very different about the signatures. Normally, the Treasury of the United States will be on the left and the Secretary would be on the right. In this case, we're both on the left-hand side. Okay, let's discuss this. What's the significance in the Treasurer and the Secretary signing the bill on the same left-hand side? The significance of the treasurer and secretary signing a bill on the same left-hand side is rooted in tradition and symbolism. On U.S. currency, the treasurer and secretary signatures appear on the left hand on the left side to symbolize the unification of the treasury's two highest offices. This tradition dates back to the Civil War era, era as we we're just looking at 1776, when. The first widely circulated $1 bill uh, featured the portrait of Salmon, of Salmon P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasurer at that time. The placement of their signature on the same side signifies the collaboration and joint responsibility of these two officials in overseeing the nation's finances. This tradition has been maintained over the years, reflecting the importance of these two positions in the management of the country's currency and economy. They haven't done that. You heard her say we're doing something different now. This is my favorite thing, she says. We're doing something different now. Now they're both on the left-hand side. On there, they have the quill, the pen, the inkwell, and they have the just in that Liberty Bell. We have the 1776 date as well now. Things are going back in time. We're going back to the future. Very, very different from years past. So again, um, if you'd like to see this up front, we will have them available. You already have them at the booth, but hopefully I will have one with me. And we can uh, kind of take it for a test run and see if you can tell, if you can see those motion activated features. So we are very, very excited about this. We are also very excited about this mainly because of the symbolism inside of all of this stuff that they're bringing forward now. 
There are things happening behind the scenes that people are just not aware of. Speaking of things happening behind the scenes, the World Bank, Digital Government for Developments. What does this mean? What, what, what does this mean? The concept of digital government represents a fundamental shift in the way governments around the world are embracing their mission from setting measurable administrative goals to improving public service delivery, from making data-driven decisions to enacting evidence-based policies, from ensuring greater accountability and transparency within, the, the, within government, to, to building greater public trust, governments are leveraging the power of information technologies in transformative ways. Are they? We believe that government, that future government services will have three broad characteristics. One is contextual. Um, two is coordinated. They've, <laughs> they've had coordinated movements already. We've lived through it and we're going to live through it still. And three, cognitive. So now that we have that, I'm going to show you this here. This is the EAEU 2025 Digital Agenda Prospects and Recommendations. This is in Russia. It's in the five provinces, I believe it is, of Russia. Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Okay, so I was way off the mark. So the locations, uh, Eurasia, like I was suggesting earlier with Russia. So the post-Soviet Union, so namely Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, yeah, Kyrgyzstan and Russia. That's the locations of this 2025 agenda. So I have some highlighted things in here. I just want to take you guys through them. Okay. So here we go here. If we jump through this. Can I not zoom in on this? That's unfortunate. Development of digital economy in Europe and Central Asia. Here's the developing country, digital countries here now. So the emerging on the bottom left there, that small little circle, unless I can get my mouse here, that small circle here is the emerging. Here's the transitioning economy. That's like everybody. And here's the transforming. They already had begun their transforming. There we go. Approval. Here are these six <coughs> listed agendas, or the six listed items for this agenda. Approval of the concepts and strategy of the EAEU digital implementation or tra digital transformation for 2025. Approval of the government structure for implementation of the digital agenda 2025. I read you the, the, the government breakdown already, those three different things there. The creation of an investment fund for digital transformation, an investment fund. Harmonization of the legal and regulatory framework for digital transformation. Five, development of cross-border telecommunication, cybersecurity, electronic identification, and logistics systems. So you hear all that? Listen to what number six is. Number six is the creation of a unified digital platform, a unified ledger for the EAEU. That's what this is. That's what this document is about. The 2025 agenda. So, is 2025 our year? I'd like to think it is. There's so much happening in that year. We got Basel 3 being implemented, China, US, uh, Europe, call it known as the end game in 2025 for US. Um, Swift is Swift. Swift? US and Canada, they are relinquishing certain messaging codes within the Swift system. I, I don't remember which messaging codes they were. It's been a while since I looked at that. 2025 is the re-evaluation of crypto stablecoins as well. So that'll be very, very interesting to see what happens then. What else is taking place here? First, there's a need to create the institutional and legal basis for digital for, for this digital agenda. Here, it is important to provide for the provision. Am I recording? Okay. For the provide for the division of roles, responsibilities, and authority. I want to get bigger here. This is like there we go, that's what's up. And authority between national and regional organizations. Second, it is necessary to allocate sufficient financial resources taking into account the long-term and complex nature of the transformation. Right? The long-term. Long-term. So if y'all got a weekend, sell that to me, I'll buy it up. 
we'll figure this out, all right? Third, programs should be launched to increase the overall level of the digital skills and digital literacy among broad sectors of society, which are necessary to launch and sustain the dynamics of new digital economy. And finally, new telecommunication services should be deployed, including widespread broadband internet access, which is taking place all across Africa and India now, to support the development and deployment of secure and tele the reliable cross-border intersectoral the digital platforms and digital solutions. Whew. That was English. There it is. So, inception, the first stage of the implementation of the EAEU's digital agenda. We got the roadmap, son. That's how we do here on Mr. Man's channel. I don't play around. I go right to the horse's mouth. I'm not trying to figure out things reading news articles and they're throwing you off and taking you all around bushes and... Sh nah, I don't got time for that. The creation of a unified information system is envisaged by the Treaty on the EAEU. Article 23 defines the framework for cooperation in the field of information sharing within the Union. It prescribes that uh, interaction on information sharing within the UN within the Union is carried out through the Union's integrated information system, which ensures the integration of territorial the distributed state information resources and information systems of authorized bodies, as well as information resources and information systems of the commission. So what this sounds like to me is each individual nation, starting with Russia, the 2025 agenda, not Russia, well, Russia, Belarus, Armenia, they have their own 2025 agenda for their internal ecosystem in that area, the post-Soviet, Soviet, Soviet you, whatever it's called, within their ecosystem. Europe's going to have theirs, Canada's going to have ours, unless ours is being rolled out with the US, US going to have theirs, Mexico going to have theirs, whatever, BRICS going to have theirs, however that may look. And eventually, we're going to get to a point in 2024, before this goes live, we have to have that uh, Embridge rollout. Money policies need to change internally. Actually, my guy Dark Horse wrote about this today. As of the 2024, in January, Bank of England has updated their policy to include CBDCs now. Updated their policies to include CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. Now, with the platform like Embridge going live in 2024, MVP going live, minimum viable product going live, when money and this unified platform goes live, you can now offer cross-border payments within that Embridge ecosystem of CBDCs, which is now a policy in EU. <sighs> Hope you all understand what I'm saying here. If not, let me know in the comments down below. While you're down there, tell me what you do like, because I do appreciate hearing these. I, I do, I love the comments. I respond to everybody. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Let's continue going on here. Speaking of money, speaking of money, before I continue, let me... So since we're on the topic of money and how money will look, it's being implemented as CBDCs, internal policies changing in EU, we have the 43rd Treasurer, Rosie Reels, talking about money how it looked back in 2013 when they were implementing, going to, or still are implementing the new $100 bill for the US and all the security features on there. The Quill, the Inkwell, July 4th, 1776. Security features. How do you get someone from that to this, right? Like we use this stuff now. We use this stuff now. But people still like and still have their healthy dose of digital currencies that they like. I mean digital currencies, physical fiat that they like. There's going to be a hard push to give up regular fiat currencies. I've shown you, I want to say two or three segments ago, the individual 
who was on that payments um, conference there talking about how the U.S. is going to implement it. They're going to come up with the boogeyman, the boogity boogity man, and scare people into it. We know this. You know this already. I've provided the facts. I've shown you the, the WHO treaties. I've shown you the soft coup taking place. You've heard inside parliaments. So now let's hear how Jed McCaleb, founder of Ripple, creator of Mount Gox, which is about to release uh, several thousands of, of uh, Bitcoin into the ecosystem, which will potentially have a negative effect on the price of Bitcoin. Could take it down significantly from where it's at right now. Let's hear how he suggests that people will onboard into crypto or what the thesis is to get people into crypto. Take it away, Jed. Exactly. Yeah, we've been we've been singing this this song for a long time now. So it's cool to see that that it's it's actually starting to take hold and like people are are, are starting to get it and, and it's becoming useful in the wider world. I mean, I, I like I think this has been our thesis all along is that I think for crypto get to be adopted widely, like you need this bridge from from the existing uh, you know forms of payment that people use from from existing currencies, right? So. Like it's hard to get people to jump straight to something like Bitcoin when they're, that's not what they're used to. You know, when you go to the grocery store, you don't pay in Bitcoin, you pay in dollars or whatever your local currency is, right? And so there needs to be some way to like have have a digital dollar or have a digital peso or whatever it, and and be able to use that in, in some network like Bitcoin or some one of these decentralized networks. And once you have that, then you can kind of get get more and more adoption to this decentralized system. And then then, then you can start using the internal native tokens right and so that's kind of been our thesis from the beginning so it seems like that's what's kind of starting to play out which is exciting yes so when the 2025 agenda that we're reading about here for eurasia the eaeu we need infrastructure we need internet we need internet infrastructure and who better to offer that but jed mccaleb how and why that man goes to the what's it called business satellite business week Business, World Business Satellite Week. All right, it's called the World Business Satellite Week, which takes place annually in September. We know he's rolling out a uh, a, a bus size um, space station called Vast. This is what most of the world doesn't know about. There is a satellite system called Galileo. In the G, in the in the in the West here. In Canada and U.S., we use G, what's known as GPS, Global Positioning System. Out in Russia, they have GLONASS, G-L-O-N-A-S-S. In EU now, they're rolling out Galileo, which already been rolled out. Now let's see what Galileo is all about. Today, it is impossible to imagine a world without satellite navigation. Millions of people around the world would suddenly be lost. Since the late 90s, Thales Selenia Space is involved in all development phases of a new advanced satellite navigation system, Galileo. This cutting-edge system of 30 satellites unlocks a complete new set of technological features. Now, you will know your exact position with a precision never reached before. How is it all done? Come take a look. Precise time and orbit control guarantee the extreme accuracy of the system. The principle of Galileo is to measure the distance and the time difference between the receiver and the satellite. It pinpoints the user's position, time and speed by triangulating data from different satellites. Just a billionth of a second clock error corresponds to a 30 centimeter increase in ranging error. One second delay would put users 300,000 kilometers off target. Galileo tracks anything that moves by road, rail, air, and at sea, and offers new services for all types of needs. The open service provides improved accuracy and robustness in complex environments like cities. The commercial service 
delivers authentication and high accuracy business applications. The search and rescue channel locates people in distress and leads first responders. The public regulated service, an encrypted channel, delivers greater and safer availability. More than 150 European partners work together on this technological challenge. Thales Alenia Space has been a major contributor to the program, developing the core ground infrastructure, satellite equipment, and providing high quality industrial system support to our customers. Galileo is the first civilian run system that guarantees continuity of access and signal quality, unlike its military centric competitors. The Galileo chipset is already available on many smartphones and sat-nav devices. All cars manufactured in Europe equipped by 2018. So now you know. So we just learned about the Galileo satellite system now. So here we are. Stellar 2024. This is from the EENA. This is essentially the EBS, the Emergency Broadcast System. Right? Um, if you are, I guess, in a similar circle to myself, you've heard of this You've heard this potentially 10 days of darkness, the EBS sounds, electronic broadcast system sounds. People are finally made aware of what happens. Whether, excuse me, whether that's true or not, how that goes down, I don't know. I'm just putting the pieces together, but here we go. As the number of natural hazards and risks are growing in all parts of the world, it is essential for public authorities to implement efficient public warning systems. One of the main channels to alert the, pub the population are the telecommunication networks as most people are next to their mobile phone almost all the time. However, some natural hazards may impact the telecommunication infrastructure, depriving civil protection authorities from this important public warning channel. The Stellar Project aims to address this gap by preparing the entry of Galileo Early Warning Service into the market. This will involve developing an interface to allow for Galileo satellites to interact with cell phones and convey early warning messages via the satellite signal, making the service operational even when telephone networks are down. Demonstrations will also be organized throughout Europe in collaboration with the public authorities. The project began in April of 2022 and will end in 2024. Stellar brings together a consortium of EU companies with expertise in satellite navigation and emergency management. Management. It is led by Telespazio Fra France, France and is composed by the CNES, EENA, WA 112, F24, France and Belgium, and Thales Alina Space. That's what we were over at, the ENA, the EENA. So my question, because I found this and saw Stellar there, like I gotta know. The Stellar project utilizes blockchain technology in various ways such as enabling decentralized exchanges, um, facilitating cross-border payments and issuing digital assets. The Stellar network, powered by the Stellar consensus, consensus protocol, eliminates the need for intermediaries, reducing costs associated with transactions. So we're talking about Stellar there. So show me links for Stellar. So. The Stellar project is closely connected to the Stellar blockchain, right? This is the Stellar project right here. The Stellar project right there. Connected to the Stellar blockchain, which is decentralized public blockchain network for payments and tokenization. It enables the creation of decentral exchanges, cross-border payments, and the issuance and then here, does this connect through the EENA? The Stellar project is indeed connected to the EENA number associated uh, European Emergency Number Association. The project aims to prepare for and prepare the entry of the Galileo Early Warning Service into the market by developing an interface to allow Galileo satellites to connect 
interact with cell phones and convey early warning messages via the satellite signals, making the service operational even when the telephone networks are down. The Stellar project, led by that, those names there, focused on addressing the need for efficient public warning systems, especially in situations where traditional telecommunications infrastructures may be impacted. This initiative demonstrates the practical application of the, proje of the Stellar project in conjunction with the Galileo satellite system, highlighting its relevance in con context of emergency management and public safety. So coming back here now to this unified platform here with telecommunication, finances, let's, uh, just, let's, just, go, let's just go back. Development of cross-border telecommunication, cybersecurity, electronic identification, and logistics system. So we've seen the telecommunication and how that's going to drop. So it, in 2020, the strategic direction for the developing Eurasian economic integration until 2025 outlines the key priorities for the union's development, the role and place of the digital agenda and the strategy and the extent to which its provisions, purple's a terrible color for reading in a mask, by the way. So for all y'all who wanna keep your identities hidden and you're wearing a mask like this, light purple is a terrible color. Maybe I can increase the, there we go to address existing problems and barrier and deepen integration can be analyzed. Available facts, data, adopted documentations, and literature can be interpreted to draw some conclusions regarding the progress of the agenda. The achievements, problems, barrier, and challenges, as well as to, to provide recommendations on possible fu future directions for cooperation. The aim of this article is to identify the specific features of the EAEU's 2025 digital agenda and the challenges to its implementation in the context of overall integration processes in the region. This study focuses on supranational processes, inter interactions within the EAEU institutions and relations between the national and supranational national levels. While national digital digitalization programs are being successfully implemented, the national level of decision making and agenda setting is not the subject of this study. So it's international. The study reviewed the existing body of literature on the subject. Okay, I don't want to read that. So here now we're in the E what is it called? E A E U. So here we are. The Treasure Treaty on the Eurasian Economic Union Part 1, Establishment of the Eurasian Economic Union. So I'm reading the behind-the-scenes stuff that many people don't read. We were at 6, I believe it was. There we go. This is the monetary policy now, which, is the, which proposes the principle for coordinating monetary policy. There's nothing there yet. Right? Like I don't have the behind-the-scenes on that yet. And as we go through Appendix 3 to the Protocol and Regulations and Procurement, list of procurement procedures for a single source or from sole supplier. So I'm looking to try and get the full documents. This whole document is the table of contents. Now what I need is the connection to these here for the Eurasian area, for the EAEU. Hopefully I'll have that by the next video. I hope you guys found some value in this and these connections that I make here. Because, man, I'll be making some connections. I'll be making some connections. I'll be making some connections. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Have a deserving evening. Love you all. Catch you all on the next one. We're making moves. We're making major moves. We're making moves.